so uh, let's get started. Um, my name is Mike Chital. Um, I'm from Playbrain. Uh, we're a company out of Tokyo. Um, this talk is about frictionless media and why uh, community is the new marketing. So a little bit about me to start with. Um, yes, you can see I look very Japanese. Um, I, I've, I'm an Australian living in Tokyo for 16 years now. Um, and uh, 20 years in games and marketing, so I, I've worked in a number of different capacities doing that. Um, most recently, um, right now my company, Playbrain, is, is a company that we started two years ago. Um, but previous to that, I was running a creative agency in Tokyo where we were doing a lot of uh, very youth market-focused youth market focused, um, uh, work. Uh, so we were working for clients such as Red Bull, uh, Heineken, Beats by Dre, uh, brands like this. And uh, this one, um, this has given me a, a very interesting perspective on, uh, on marketing uh, that I've brought to games. But uh, previous to that, I was also very involved with uh, games as well in Australia. Um, I worked for a gaming company for, uh, for about four years before I moved to Japan. Um, along the way, I also built a social media analytics company called Lens, uh, which uh, later on we, uh, we actually absorbed into Ultra Supernew, which is the creative agency that I ran. So just to, to give a bit of a broad background on uh, what I've done. At Playbrain, uh, we do um, a number of different things. Uh, we run the LJL, which is the League of Legends um, uh, Esports Pro League um, uh, uh, for Japan. Um, we also develop uh, Deki.com, which is a platform that uh, companies can game companies can use to power their communities. And so we, uh, we run that for uh, titles such as uh, Gwent, Overwatch, uh, Hearthstone, etc. Um, and uh, this is a service, it's actually a more a regional uh, service, but most of our clients and most of our users are actually in Japan. Um, we support right now Japanese, Korean, um, traditional Chinese and English. Um, and we also do a lot of streaming production and uh, video production for, for games companies as well. So Playbrain itself, we're very focused on games industry only, uh, but we do a lot of the different things that we're going to be talking about today, which is a little bit about where my background comes from. So um, who here comes from a little bit of a marketing background? Show of hands. Okay, so we've got a bit of a marketing side and community side. Uh, it's about 50-50, all right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe sort of define some terms so we, can, uh, we, we know what we're talking about. Um, so marketing being the study and management and ex of exchange relationships. Uh, marketing is used to create, keep, and satisfy the customer. So the, um, when we're talking about game marketing, quite often we, we think about this acquisition. It's, it's like a lot of the perception of game marketing right now. And uh, a lot of what we're, we're talking about today is, well, maybe that perception needs to change and we need to be thinking more about those second two as well. So the keep and satisfy is incredibly important part of the marketing activities. Um, so, you know, more users in, equals more players, therefore the acquisition side is, is very much where the, uh, where the um, focus is. Um, but, you know, there is something missing. Uh, so we're going to be talking here about frictionless media. This is a concept that, uh, that we use to describe the work that we do. Um, and uh, this is very much powered by community. Um, and how is that that's bringing something very vital to the, today's games and why that's specifically necessary in today's games. Um, and I'm also going to take you through the four truths of uh, frictionless marketing as well, which is uh, the, the emotions that we're actually trying to stimulate. So when we talk about community, we, we actually want to think about what the intention and what the emotion is of our users um, to make sure that we're actually giving them something that's valuable to them. Okay, so current marketing model as we talked about. We're actually, uh, we, we have these measurement um, uh, analytics that we use, um, CPA, cost per acquisition, um, DAU, daily active users, uh, ARPU, um, uh, the average revenue per user, all these sort of stats that we have, there's a lot more to. Um, they, they're actually really good ways to start to measure uh, the way that our game is performing and how successful our activities in marketing are. Um, but, um, when, we, when we're actually looking at uh, the way that this data is used, uh, most of the actions that we're taking are very acquisition-based. Yeah? Um, and I think this is um, something that 
there is a bit of a trend starting to change right now, but um, this is still um, within a marketing function of a company, uh, still very acquisition-based. We need more users is the answer instead of let's make the users that we have more valuable as well as getting more users. Um, so the most effective way of reaching a lot of eyeballs uh, is focusing on mass visibility and awareness, and we, we get a lot of that. Um, so let me take you through a few of what that means in today's market. Um, you know, 0.05%. Uh, Anybody uh, can hazard a guess at what that is? This is the average click-through rate that you get on a web banner, 0.05%. Um, and that's considered a good click-through rate, right? So if you're doing a display advertising, um, you know, you're getting incredibly low um, response rate through that advertising. Um, and you're going to be paying cost per 1,000 impressions is going to be something between $1 and $10. It can be a lot more than that as well. Uh, we see prices, depending on which media you're going to in Japan, of you know, up to $30 can, can be actually a, a, a common thing as well. Um, cost per acquisition puts it in the um, uh, sort of that two to twenty dollar mark generally, um, which is pretty high if you don't have a high revenue churning game. Uh, so um, all these things are very highly measurable. So generally, marketers think this is a very safe thing to work with. Um, we can look at uh, those numbers and go, "Oh, okay, we're going to get about this back on it. That's great, but it's only part of the picture." Um, here's a different type of advertising that we see a lot. This is OOH, this is a big billboard that um, sits in, uh, uh, this is uh, Shibuya Station, one of the most popular, one of the, I think it's the number four busiest station in the world. Um, we have about 2.4 million people come through there every day. Um, so uh, one of the things there we, we, we've done, this is a particular uh, project we did for Clash of Clans a few years back. Um, uh, we were very proud of the creative work Super happy with what we did there. Um, but uh, um, if you notice something about this picture, um, how many of those people are actually in our target market? You have an answer? <laughs> One maybe, yeah. So, you know, um, in terms of that target market, we're actually, even the, the girl at the left, at the bottom, potentially could be, but generally for this particular game, we're actually a very male skewed audience. Maybe that guy at the top, but he's actually potentially older than our target market as well. So we'll give him a maybe. But I, I did a quick, um, you know, on, on a napkin kind of uh, analysis of this, and we get to maybe one in 5,000 people are really gonna be uh, interested in downloading our game. Um, based on, you know, 5% are actually in that core target. Um, 40% uh, of those are maybe interested in mobile. 40% uh, of those are interested in the genre. Um, and then about 2.5% uh, will actually download the thing. Um, so that's about one in 5,000. And we're back to that 0.05% of actual uh, in, uh, people actually reacting to our advertising. Um, so, okay, we, we can see where we're, we're heading down this trend. Um, so uh, we, we can put a cost to that as well. Um, you know, if you want to do a takeover of Shibuya Station, you're probably looking at about $200,000 a day. Uh, it's a big station. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, different uh, media that you could take over to do that. Um, so, I mean, if you've got something that is a very mass uh, market um, orientated uh, product, taking over Shibuya Station is probably a good investment for you. You get a lot of impact. But uh, if you have something that has any kind of niche, not so effective. Yeah. Um, so you know we could get a cost per acquisition of four dollars if if we do well, probably more. Um, uh, but it also is a, a place with diminishing returns because if you think about it, Shibuya Station, same people travelling every day of the week. Um, once they've seen it, once they've uh, decided if they are interested or not, um, you know you've kind of wasted your marketing money on them. Okay, so then let's jump to television commercials. So this is another kind of advertising that we see a lot, especially in Japan. So if you're doing a game marketing in Japan, um, we do look at um, television commercial advertising quite a lot. Um, and uh, I've actually chosen to take an example that's a little bit more uh, um, US-centric for this one. So the Super Bowl, um, this has got about uh, 40 cents per person 
that you're going to reach for a 30-second spot um, in, during the Super Bowl. So, um, you know, that's, again, pretty high cost to pay for a very broad mass audience. Um, what's the click-through rate on a TV? It's very hard to measure. Um, you can probably look at um, when, you, when that spot runs and how many people download. Um, uh, but you've got a bunch of people who are watching a football game. They're not necessarily interested in downloading an app at that particular point of time. And so uh, we could probably say that uh, visibility, great. Um, actual action that comes off the back of that may not be as successful. Um, and again, broad audience. So if you've got anything niche, not so effective. Um, but changing the way we consume media uh, and games is also changing. Um, uh, so uh, if we have a look, uh, we are much more interested in the long-term player engagement than we, than we used to be. Um, you know, the two, the big changes that we've seen in the last five to ten years is a massive shift toward multiplayer um, and real-time multiplayer, and an also a massive uh, shift towards microtransaction in just the last few years. Um, and that is changing the way that we want our users to behave. We used to just want them to pay for the game, and then we're done, right? As many people pay for the game as possible, and then we're on to making the next game. But now we actually care about having those users for maybe five to ten years. It could be, could be that long that we're after. You look at a game like League of Legends, it's been around about eight years now. Um, a lot of the top games in the Japanese app store, like uh, Monster Strike, they've been around six, seven, eight years. Um, we're looking at the long-term retention as a much more important part of the way that we deal with game marketing these days. And I think we have to you know, bring up community as a solution for that. Uh, let me take you through uh, one more thing, which is about how we're ingesting media. And so um, we talked about television commercials before, but actually if we look at trends, we've got things like Netflix starting to shift people's attention to places where there aren't even any ads. So there's no way to reach those people on Netflix unless you actually produce a Netflix program. Um, you look at uh, uh, the, um, the core gamer targets actually barely watching TV. Um, you can hear, see here that second column is probably one of our core uh, game of target um, age range, uh, 16 to 24, um, and probably with the secondary one at 25 to 34. Um, those ones, are the, the, the numbers of, uh, the amount of uh, engagement they have with uh, television is really reducing. And here's another one. Um, if you're looking at online advertising, uh, the rate of people running ad blockers is increasing very, very fast. People don't want advertising is pretty much what I'm getting at. Um, this is really, really important to understand because that is telling us something about the way that we're communicating. We're interrupting the way that people are wanting to enjoy the world. <clears throat> uh, last one here, um, digital ads are actually getting more expensive and reaching fewer people um, as a result of the previous. So it's about time marketing teams started looking in different places to appeal to the players. And that's why I want to introduce frictionless media and the four truths. We'll get to the four truths. Let's start off with frictionless media. So frictionless media is media in the form of content the audience is seeking to engage with. Yep. So as opposed to a television commercial where you're trying to watch a football game, for example, um, and we're going to throw up an ad, and that's actually getting in the way of the thing that they wanted to do. So if we want to look at this as a very simple chart, it looks like this. That red circle is where they're actually trying to get to, and that blue track is where we're trying to push them. Yeah. So we're trying to shift them to, first of all, our marketing. So we want to take them away from what they wanted to do to our marketing. And then we're trying to have them make a decision to not go back to what they wanted to do, but go to our game, our destination page, landing page, whatever we're going to have there. Um, and that is, that, that is the friction that we're talking about. So. Um, my proposal is that we take an approach of frictionless. So friction, full marketing, is it gets in the way of what you wanted to see to deliver a message. Frictionless is a very straight line. Let's keep it simple. So we want to deliver marketing in a form that is proposing what the user is wanting to engage with. Yep. So very simple path, target user, what the user wants, your game. All right, so let's, let's give you some examples. Um, so uh, influencer marketing. Um, so 
you probably, many of you are familiar with this, uh, we're supporting influencers to create content. Um, common formats, video on demand, streaming content, social media, blog content. Um, there are many other forms as well that we could imagine, uh, but that's, that's, those are the common ones we're gonna see. Um, and of course, your channels are things like YouTube and Twitch and et cetera, et cetera. In Japan, we have a few domestic um, channels that are a little bit unique to the market. In Korea, you also have ones that are unique to the market. China, you have ones that are incredibly unique to the market. Um, but basically, the structure is the same. Um, then, uh, what type of content are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at uh, asking influencers to play our game, right? That's, that's a pretty obvious one. We're looking at uh, asking influencers to show build guides and advice on how to best play the game in terms of uh, structure, um, strategy. Um, we're looking on uh, opinion pieces as well, so um, uh, giving an opinion about uh, which games are the best of this specific genre or uh, what is good or bad about this particular thing. These are all different types of opinion marketing, uh, influencer marketing uh, that we can leverage to market our games. Some of them we need to pay for, some of them we don't. Uh, when we do pay for them, you know, it can be pricey in some cases or it can be incredibly cheap in others. And it depends on what kind of influence you're after and what kind of relationship you build with them. Um, the job of a community manager uh, can actually include maintaining those relationships as well. So it's not that you're just going to an agency and booking whichever um, influences you can get, build those relationships, and actually you, you'll find that you'll get much better uh, performance out of influencer marketing. Okay, next. Uh, content marketing is a different category. It looks very similar to influence marketing, so we're still VOD, streaming content, social media, blogs, uh, but now we're talking from you as a game developer's perspective. And again, we want gameplays like demos, uh, special release content, etc. Uh, possibly how to play content as well. Um, developer insights, uh, things that only you can deliver. Um, things that help uh, players get closer to you, essentially. Um, and of course, behind the scenes, et cetera, it's, it's gonna be a really good um, approach as well. Um, let them learn a little bit about, more about uh, your titles and, and what, what uh, you can share about that, and they will get much closer to your game and much more appreciate your game. Okay, next one, events. Uh, so uh, events, uh, these can be uh, online, they can be offline, uh, it can be conference festivals, um, you can be part of something bigger, you can be your own thing. They can be very casual or they can be very formal and grand scale. Um, there's a lot of different scope for events. And I've given a basic cost breakdown here of you know, anything between $5,000 and $100,000, but it could be free, just your time, or it could be a million dollars. It could be any level that you actually uh, want to justify in your marketing plan and it really depends on how you want to engage. And so we, we'll talk about a few of those examples, but um, some of the things that you might want to do are tournaments. Uh, so if you have a competitive game, tournaments are great. Um, uh, it could be game trial events. So uh, we've done a lot of things like caravans around the, around the country so that we'll uh, set up in each city with a little bit of a trial event. People can try out a game. Uh, you can do meetups. Uh, so uh, invite users to come and talk to you as the developer. Um, and just each other as well. Uh, there's, there's a number of games will actually have, the community drives their own events with, with meetups and things like that, which is also great. Um, encourage that, support that. Um, game culture-based events is, is an, another one as well, so you can have things like cosplay, um, can help people get into the culture of your event um, without actually necessarily playing your game even. Um, but these are all positives for the visibility, the engagement with the game. And the, the fourth category here is uh, tools. So um, these are things that could be website tools or app tools, for example, that help the player uh, perform better, understand better, uh, all these things around the game. Um, so some of the things that we're talking about, the obvious one is forums. So uh, provide forums so that people can ask questions of you or each other, um, but also uh, uh, strategy builders so um, you can facilitate uh, people to actually build strategies of their own design, uh, propose them to other players as ways to beat the game or perform well in the game. Um, you can have maps of the game, you can have things that you can't deliver actually in-game necessarily. You can provide as external tools to support the game. 
and you can also have game assist tools as well. So uh, that's things that maybe they're uh, little calculators that will help you understand how much damage you're gonna deal per second if you have such and such a combination or um, uh, this, this kind of thing that helps you actually do a more um, in-depth performance for the people who wanna get to another level in your game. Um, and all of these things are gonna be specific to, which, to your game which you'll choose, but all of these things are possible ways to further engage your, um, your audience in a frictionless way. So not one of these needs to interrupt another experience. They can all stand on their own. They can all be a part of the, um, the, the experience that the user is actually after. Okay, so let's get to the four truths of frictionless marketing. And so uh, in this, I'll give you each of the truths and an example of one thing that actually does that. So the first one is the human truth. So we gain a positive feeling of connection from realizing we are playing or watching real people with faults and strengths. Uh, this feeling helps us build emotional connection with the game and its players. Um, why is this emotional connection important? Um, whenever we're engaging with anything like this, uh, we're wanting to feel like there's something actually getting affected and we want to have this human connection. This is actually a, a, a subconscious deep desire with most of our players. Um, and understanding that I could do better than somebody else or I could collaborate with somebody else or I could feel like there's, you know, um, there's a places to succeed and fail. Um, these are all human interactions that will help you um, uh, engage with the game in, uh, help you develop a, a love for the game, actually. So let's call this humanized media, That's something we're gonna produce off the back of this. So an example uh, we have here is for the LJL. The LJL is the League of Legends uh, Japan League. Um, uh, and we did this piece for, um, uh, as part of a social media uh, promotion which is operated on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is pretty, um, pop uh, pretty popular, pretty powerful still in Japan. Um, and probably in terms of social media communication is probably one of the strongest channels that we can use. Um, and so what we did is we, we built some content uh, interviewing some of the players and letting them, uh, some of the pro players, and letting them uh, uh, just communicate a few things that opened up their personality a little bit. And so this is an example. This is in Japanese, so I won't uh, uh, run it for a long time, but um, uh, I can talk you through it. I don't know if we have any audio on that anyway. That not got hooked up? Ah, it's not coming through. Um, basically, uh, uh, he's, he's going through uh, um, a, little, a number of 10 questions, which is just mapping with the League of Legends uh, uh, band pick screen. Um, and they're things like, uh, w you know, which players do you like playing against or which players do you... Um, interact with uh, what's a what's a famous phrase that you like to say? Um, uh, what character do you like? It's coming out of here, so yeah, it's all right. It's all right. It's okay. It's in Japanese, so people won't understand anyway. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's just things to get out his personality a little bit. Um, and uh, this did amazing uh, things in terms of uh, um, increasing the profile of each of the players and making people feel closer to the league. Um, uh, it was a really successful thing. At the end here, and I'll let it run just until it gets there, he actually uh, is asked like a bonus question at the end where he's asked to mimic one of the uh, casters from the, from the league. And uh, he had great fun with this and the response on his performance on this was just um, huge. Like the, 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 play, the fan base like, really loved it. And it's, there's nothing particularly skillful about it from him, but um, he, it was really, really impactful. Um, and uh, so what do we see there? What were the results of it? Uh, we actually had uh, an increase 400% of the previous top retweet um, uh, records. So just by doing these, we did them uh, uh, twice a week for five weeks during the season, um, two different players every time. Um, and uh, we were upping the, the previous retweet total by about 400%. Uh, 
Um, just the engagement that came off the back of it was just incredible. Um, there was a huge increase of the awareness of the players as well, so people started to identify each of the players a lot more. Um, and there was a personal fan increase for each of those pro players too. Um, and so in terms of goals for this, um, it hit all of our um, goals, actually. Um, we, we achieved exactly what we needed to out of it. Um, so that's an example of just exposing some of the human side. Um, there was nothing perfect about what he did in front of the camera, and actually that was part of the charm. His speech wasn't natural, it wasn't uh, like media savvy, um, it, it, but it made just such a nice uh, impact. Some of the other things that might, you might want in terms of humanized media, um, direct response from developers. This is something that any of you can do without a massive investment. Uh, so if you want to respond to people on social media, tell them things that you're allowed to, like, that you're allowed to leak, um, or explain why you made certain decisions within your games. Um, these sort of things uh, are really, really valuable for a player base. Uh, studio tours. We did a um, uh, for EA. We did a studio tour of uh, the Dice Studio uh, a few years back for the Japanese audience, and this was received really, really well as a piece of content that people could actually feel a little bit closer to the development process that was behind. Uh, I think at the time it was Battlefield Four. Um, we, you can also do things like player documentaries, so you can actually interview, whether you've got a competitive game or not, um, interviewing some of the community and proposing that as content to, to be engaged with, um, to share on YouTube, etc. Um, all these things can be a great way to do humanized media. Okay, second truth. So the progress truth. Um, so when somebody feels like they can grow and learn, uh, within a game, they're more encouraged to play and keep playing um, uh, and to enjoy the game. So uh, this one, as if any of you are involved with your game design teams, this is something game designers know very well. You need to you know, manage challenges and things like this, but as a community, uh, community manager, you can actually um, empower this a little bit as well. So you can identify places where players get stuck and do things for it. So let's, let's call this over the hump media, right? So somebody's hit a challenge within the game, they can't get past it, they're considering leaving the game, let's do something to help them. So uh, the example we can talk about here is um, a Battlefield Senpai. So this is another EA uh, example. Uh, so we did this, um, uh, it's actually started uh, a bit earlier, but the example in the screenshot here is, um, that's coming up is uh, for Battlefield 1. Um, we set up a channel, a Twitter channel, which people could ask questions to, um, and we had um, you know, uh, strong players able to answer through that channel and give people advice on how to approach different aspects of the game. Uh, this is great to avoid the churn that I mentioned before um, and uh, help that engagement um, uh, with the game maintain. And so, uh, especially when, you, when you're getting into a, a game where you do want to keep people for a long time, uh, you want to have them engaged because your revenue streams actually uh, are affected by the long-term engagement, this is a great way to do that. Um, okay, and uh, what was the result of that? Um, we had an increase in Twitter followers of about 200% um, for, for this. Um, uh, we had a strengthening of regular player base um, we developed regular interaction with the play base that could then be leveraged for campaigns um, and uh, communicating around new releases as well. So um, this was uh, also a very successful campaign that we ran for uh, quite a while actually. Okay, so other examples of over the hump media. Um, community build guides, um, so decky.com that I mentioned earlier is, uh, allows that, so we do um, like deck builds for Hearthstone and Gwent for example. Um, uh, this sort of thing can be a great way for um, the community to then share um, ways to keep progressing and succeeding in the game. And of course, influencer gameplay videos are a good example of that as well. Next truth, aspirational truth. When people see a higher level that could be reached within the game, uh, they develop an aspirational attitude to the game, uh, driving passion and effort. So uh, another one that, um, uh, especially with competitive games, this is really, really important, um, but it can be appropriate to, to any games. If people can see the top performance, they can be excited by that. So reach for the stars media, let's call it that. Um, 
and one example we've got here uh, for Gwent, which actually hasn't even released 1.0 yet. Um, uh, we started a game tournament uh, last year um, and it's still going every month now uh, called the White Wolf Tournament and uh, we run it every month. It's been pretty well attended and we get we live stream it on Twitch. Um, very, very successful for such a new game that is still sort of trying to create buzz. Um, and uh, Japan has become one of the, the key markets for uh, for City Project Red in the process because we've been able to stimulate the audience. Um, so this is just some screenshots from, from the stream. I won't play, uh, won't play the video because it has to run off Twitch. Um, but uh, we, we set up with uh, casters um, and uh, we have you know nice professional setup there. We run every month, run the tournament, we find a winner. Uh, we got a little bit of prize money. We fly the top four players to Tokyo, and we have them compete. Uh, we even had a, one of the top uh, uh, performers was from uh, was from uh, Taiwan. So we even got a little bit of a regional impact from it. Um, he had to play the uh, the game in Japanese, though that was fun. Uh, <laughs> um, so the uh, the idea of uh, creating something that demonstrates top performance um, excited other players to try to compete, try to get into the next tournament, um, and uh, has done great for, for um, giving a nice baseline to the community there. Uh, what did we achieve? We established the community of Gwent in Japan, uh, and we also uh, regularly um, uh, get into the top, we regularly top the rankings for Gwent on Twitch. Um, pretty much any time we're streaming, we're top of the Twitch rankings. Okay, other examples might be pretty much anything esports. Um, uh, there are more as well, but that's the one I'll throw out for now. Um, anything esports is showing top level play. And the last truth, because I know I'm running short on time, um, inclusion truth. Uh, when people feel like they're part of the culture of a game, they are more inclined to contribute and engage with activities and gameplay. So comfy, me comfy sofa media, we're going to call it. Um, and the example I've got here is Hearthstone World. And so uh, working with Blizzard, uh, we, uh, we set up a weekly uh, Twitch stream where we have two in key influencers um, come on and they bring on a community, uh, um, someone from the community to talk about the meta, talk about good decks to play, talk about news that's happening, uh, talk about fun stuff. Um, and uh, we go through a bunch of uh, um, gameplay that they can play against people who are, are watching live on the stream as well. So they'll usually play a few games against people watching. To our show weekly, we've been running almost a year already for this. Um, we also have some international guests occasionally too. Jackie Chan, who's a famous um, uh, 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 Hearthstone player out of the UK. Uh, results, uh, we actually have near 100% awareness amongst top influencers in Japan, for top, top Hearthstone influencers in Japan. Um, pretty much anybody you speak to watches the show. Um, uh, so if you go to a tournament or whatever, they're all very heavily engaged. Um, we developed a regular audience who will tune in every week and we provide a platform for news information to be distributed to the most passionate users. Um, and I'm out of time, so I'm gonna very quickly jump to the end, which is just a little bit of a summary. Uh, traditional media is losing its effectiveness. Community can fill that gap. Uh, frictionless media is a community-focused marketing solution um, that can become a part of a game's marketing plan and Frictionless media equals be the destination, not the speed bump. And the four frictionless media truths, human truth, progress, aspirational, and inclusion. Thank you very much.